Good afternoon. I am extremely honored to be here today. I promised my daughter, uh, my grandson, and my friend, Mrs. Pinkston, that I would stick to my script. <laughs> when I'm in, a, in the presence of individuals who give off good vibes, I have a tendency to share all that I have. And if you were not a, a good group, I would have a short presentation. So I don't know whether or not you are blessed or you are condemned. <laughs> but I, I do want to, to thank you for being here today. I want to also thank uh, Dean Rutherford for the great hospitality that we've received. Ms. Pinkston and I drove up yesterday and we had an encounter with the bridge. I don't like bridges and I don't like water. And um, I kept wondering, is it worth it? Do I just need to just turn around and go back home? But after last night, I realized that I would probably cross two or three more bridges because the, uh, the hospitality uh, has been excellent. In addition to thanking the dean, I want to thank Bob and Mary Ellen for being who they are and for caring, actually caring about people in this day and age is unfortunately obsolete, but they care. And I want to publicly thank both of them for all that they do. And it was my pleasure to, to be introduced to Markeisha. Um, you know, you don't expect young people her age to have that old kindred spirit, but you have it. And your parents should be commended for instilling that in you. And the students who were here last night, I also appreciate uh, their presence. Uh, this is my second trip to, to Little Rock. And the first was almost 20 years ago when a friend and I came to Little Rock and we went another route. I know we didn't cross the bridge. <laughs> but we were coming because uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore were up for re-election. I got a good feeling about, about Arkansas uh, at that time, but, but uh, the second trip around beats that. 20 years later, perhaps I'm older, but I, I sense that the goodness of people sort of struck my heart. And it's in this day and age with the, the national problems that we're having, the international reactions, the local problems that we're having, goodness is not certainly uh, a word that is on our agenda. It should be, though. I was thinking that I would speak to younger people, not that anybody in, not that everybody in this room is not young, but I was thinking it would be younger people but I feel good now because I'm not outnumbered. <laughs> some of you can identify with, with uh, some of the things I'm gonna talk about and I don't have to worry about anybody tweeting or twittering, whatever that is. Uh, so I'm, I'm really comfortable now. Now, this is a very special day. Yesterday, I did not have an opportunity to, to go to Mass. And therefore, I did not get what my grandson calls a black sign. But I felt that I did here. There was a peace that came over me. And people who are responsible for that peace were not putting on. They were not tolerating or faking. Ms. Pinkston and I talked about that. It was 
it was, you know, you can tell when somebody likes you. And you can tell when somebody is getting paid to be nice to you. We didn't get the latter. So I, I, I again want to, to say that those of you who are part of this family know that, that, that we are most appreciative. And I didn't worry too much last night because I did not go to Mass. I felt the blessings I had been bestowed. I also realized that I ate too much <laughs> on Fat Tuesday. And I had to suffer yesterday because I gave up chocolate. Yeah, that's right. I, you know, I, I, I think that was a fatal mistake. But, but my body is really happy. But I see things differently when I don't have sweets. I saw, and I, I keep dwelling on last night, but I saw something that made me realize that um, life is not all about what we want. It's more about what we need and what others need. So the, the words that I prepared last week are still appropriate even in light of the fact that I'm looking at it from a different perspective. And the two questions that I <clears throat> chose to, to deal with is, why did I choose to attend the University of Mississippi School of Law? It's commonly called Ole Miss. And the other question is, how did my experiences there prepare me for the practice of law? I was offered four scholarships to attend the university and gladly accepted all of them. So I didn't have to pay anything to attend law school. But I chose to work. I chose to work at North Mississippi Rural Legal Services and at the law school library because that's how I was read. We were talking about that. You know, I, I was read that <clears throat> when you get up in the morning and thank God for, for, for letting, excuse me, letting you live. You need to determine how you're going to spend your day before you get out of the bed. I used to think that was insane. But Daddy would always tell us, if you don't know what you're going to do, you're going to get in the way of somebody else who knows what they're going to do. And a lot of times I think about that. It's, you know, why am I getting up in the morning? You got to get up because you got your to-do list, to -do list to do. And my daughter would get, still gets aggravated when I call and she you know, how you doing, Mama? How was last night? I found, what you going to do today? Mama, hold up just a minute. How you doing first? My mind is still focused on, and the older I get, what am I going to do with the time that I have left? Will I make a difference? So when... I got these scholarships. I just couldn't sit down. I had to do something. And I could not study 24 7. That was just out of the question. You know, I'm just not that kind of a person. I don't need to make all A's. I just need to get out. <laughs> and at the university, that was really what I wanted to do. At Tougaloo, I guess I had to make all A's because it was a family tradition. At the University of Mississippi, there was no family tradition. I want to get in and get out. And, and the, 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 the good thing about it is that I have to do something that's meaningful, that helps somebody else in order to function. So when I was in property class listening to the rule against perpetuity and, you know, and all these concepts that should be broken down so that the average person can understand them, I couldn't function like that. I didn't want to live in a vacuum. I wanted the legal profession to be able to help change the system. So I went to law school to change the system. It was not until I started practicing law that I realized, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, that I was going to get paid. 
when the Lawyers Committee came and recruited me to work with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which was a group that was founded by President Clinton, I mean President Kennedy, when he told me I was going to make $14,000 a year, that was back in 1970. And I said, I know I didn't hear you say 14,000, three zeros. Yet I had no idea because that's not what I went to law school to do. But fortunately, with that salary, I could do what I wanted to do, and that was bring about change. And I remember my dad telling me, he said, you gonna make what? I said, he said $14,000. He said, I have been a principal for almost 20 years, and I don't get half that amount. And a little bell went off in my mind, oh, but you will. So you start looking at the inequities in salaries that public educators make. So the University of Mississippi helped me deal with problems that were always there and I never identified them until I got that legal training. I also knew that I wanted to stay in the state of Mississippi. I didn't want to go to New York. Had no desire to go to California, Chicago. I want to stay right here because the changes were needed here. So I wanted to learn what lawyers that I would be practicing against and with, I wanted to learn what they knew. You, you can't walk in, in my, you can't go in a certain direction and take a certain position unless you've been there. It makes it much easier. So those are some of the reasons that I went to the university. But one of the main reasons was that when I finished all of my classes, that was it. I was a lawyer. It was called diploma privilege. There's no such thing as studying for the bar. So really, boil it all down, that probably comes to the top. When you finish your final exams as a third year student, and you pass, successfully pass, you are sworn in as an attorney. I was sworn in or, uh, January the 28th of 1970. I was in court three days later. I was before the United Mississippi Supreme Court three months later. So when, you, when I got out, I was ready to go. Now, the second question is, how did my experiences at the university prepare me to practice law? Had I not gone to the university and been subjected to some of the, the events and some of the treatment that, 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 that I received, I, I don't think I could have succeeded. Um, I had a law, law school professor who used the word nigger, but he dressed it up by saying nigra. And I thought I was hearing things. This is in a class. And in response to, you, to your question, instinctively I had to raise my hand and say, well, how do you spell that? And I didn't realize that I could have flunked. You know, I didn't get the grade I thought I deserved, but it was just instinctive. That injustice, that insult, caused me to just forget about my grade. And I know when I talked to my dad, he just laughed. He thought it was so funny. He said, somebody is going to sit you down. You better learn when, when to be quiet and when to talk. And then he laughed again. He said, but I'm so glad you asked me. What did he say? <laughs> and I said, he said, uh, he said, negra, N-E-G-R-O. Well, back then you called it Negro if it's N-E-G-R-O. So he had a cross between nigger and nigra. But I surprised him when he gave me a grade that I thought uh, I did not earn. I took another class under him. And we're okay now. 
But had I not had that experience at the university, when the judge called me, not nigra, nigger, in Rankin County, L.B. Porter, Chancellor Porter, call me nigger. If you get out of that seat, I'll have you arrested. Mr. Sheriff, and the sheriff was ready to go, Jonathan Edwards. And I'm calling names. I know what I'm talking about. You know, so if anybody wants to sue, come on. <laughs> and the sheriff was waiting. And I was getting ready to get out of my seat. I was, we were going to get it on that day. And my boss, George Peach Taylor from Alabama, said, kind of please sit down. And I said, not today. Uh-uh, he didn't get away with it. And he said, who's going to get you out of jail? Because none of us can actually practice law without you. And he was right. These lawyers that had come down to help us, none of them could practice law in Mississippi without having a member of the bar to introduce them. And I sat down. But I fought back tears. And when the judge realized that I didn't fall for his trap, I could tell that he was sort of nervous. So when he dismissed court, I went straight to two lawyers who were his friends. And I'm not going to tell you what I told them. But I did say this. He can call me nigger all day long but not as judge. If I'm going to have to respect his position and call him, yes, sir, your honor, then he's going to have to respect me. I didn't use those exact words. I left and I went home to Forest, which is about 20 miles away, and I told my daddy. He had a difficult time believing that that happened. Judge Porter? Yes, sir. Because he was kind and nice when he came around every four years for votes. And see, he had never seen, ever seen, a black person in court other than a defendant. And that was something that he couldn't deal with. He could not handle that. And so it's true, it, it, it just came out. What happened is history. We found someone to announce that they were going to run against him. He was old, and he was white, but he was decent. And once Porter realized that Guy Knighton was going to run against him or was going to run, he decided it was time for him to retire. And the, the irony of it is that the judge who appointed me to be judge was Guy Knighton. The same man who replaced the man who called me nigger. And I see something ironic in that. I occupied the same bench that he occupied. And I always remember, tell me God is not in the divine plan. And every time he saw me after then, his face just automatically just drew up. See, that's what I tell people right now. Hate will kill you. It'll destroy your ability to live. So the experiences at the university prepared me to deal with anything. And I never thought that I could take that without losing my mind. But I'm grateful, and I hope that the young people understand that the older you get, the more you realize that we have to build on our experiences. It may have been negative back then, or it may be negative now, but there's a civil, civil lining in the darkest clouds. 
I want to, to close, and obviously I must confess, I did not stick to my script. <laughs> I see Miss Pinkston looking funny because she's, you know, like, that's not what you were supposed to say. But I want to say that when I became a Rotarian, I never thought that the experiences would be this great. And we were talking about that earlier. But I've learned that we may come from different parts of town. You may live on the side where there are no sidewalks. And I may live on the side where there are sidewalks. You may not have running water, and I may have warm and cold water. But we're in this together. And looking at this audience, it makes my heart so happy to know that we all realize that we need each other and we're in this together. And I'm thankful to Bob and Mayor Ellen for introducing me to people who care. And I'm just so proud, Madam Governor, to see that our men understand the strength that women give and women have. And this may not be the most appropriate venue, but I'm happy to see women taking leadership roles. And I'm also happy to see men who appreciate us and our talents in a positive manner, as opposed to putting us down and making us reach up. I'm glad to see men reaching down and helping us and lifting us as we climb. I'm open for questions if there are any. Thank you so very much for your attention. Judge, thank you. All right. Um, questions? Please raise your hand. Anyone have a question? Before we, I, I've got one, Patrick, then we'll get you. Yeah. <laughs> Would you tell that story that you told us um, about your advice to young people about your first time you, when you went to the Supreme Court and standing and looking at the all-white male Mississippi Supreme Court? Yes, sir. Um, in one of my classes taught by Judge Etheridge, it was a legal profession class, um, I raised a question about how c could I convince people who had nothing in common with me, judges, because then there were no black judges, no black legislators, you know, how can I talk to, to, to whites about problems that black people face? Yeah, yeah, just, and uh, his advice, and it was similar to the advice that my father had given, but he said, whenever you talk to a judge, look them in the face, look them in the eye. Well, that resonated with me because my daddy always told us, never, ever talk to anybody unless you make eye contact. Don't bow your head, you don't start shuffling, make eye contact and let them know that you are an individual. So I had a problem because I, I wasn't quite sure I could look at these judges, and most of them were older and had funny looking eyes. I call them beady eyes. Most of the eyes looked like Judge Porter's eyes, and you know, and I couldn't look at that one. So I just, oh Lord, I do. So I had to argue the case maybe four months out of law school, and I got a feel for it. And instead of looking at their eyes, I looked at their eyebrows. And I talked to eyebrows <laughs> and convinced the eyebrows that the case should be reversed. 
And I think all of those judges are dead now, so they will never know I was not talking to them, I was talking to their eyebrows. <laughs> and it made a difference. You know, when people know that you're serious, you know, I can tell when my grandson is not being honest because he will not look at me. Trey, did you, have you seen, no ma'am. <laughs> it's obvious, but now if he looks me straight now, he said, no, 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 I didn't do it. Well, I don't have to, I don't have to back up on that. If he gives me an eye contact, because he know, knows how important that is, we're good. Bob, that's why I love him so much. He's a good spirit and he has a good heart and he's honest. And, and, and that's what really matters, being honest. Well, I think talking to the eyebrows is a pretty good idea. <laughs> and a pretty good speech communication lesson. Okay, Patrick, you got a question here. So I know some of your work um, in the past has been around um, voters' rights and getting voters registered. And you talked to Marquis and I in the back about the importance of voting. Um, and I want to know what work has been happening in Mississippi um, since the reversal by the Supreme Court. And I know that there have been some issues in the past couple of years. So what uh, work is being done currently in Mississippi and what has, um, what has been the result of some of those actions taken recently uh, for voters in Mississippi? Truthfully, uh, the, um, I'm not optimistic. And one of the reasons I'm not optimistic is the upcoming redistricting task. Post-Shelby um, actions, I don't believe they're going to be effective. And I'm just being opt I mean, I'm just being honest. I try to be optimistic, but this world that we live in today is so divided. When the fight comes up about redistricting, it's going to be awful. The, the present redistricting that we have in Congress is awful. You have to either be to one extreme or the other. And the way the, the districts are being carved up, it, you ask yourself, what, not who, what drew these districts? Make no sense. I mean, just, just really pretty political, all of them political. So I'm not going to deceive the young people by saying, oh, I'm optimistic and I, everything is going to be all right. I'm putting the, the responsibility on them. What can you do? Now, we've done what we can do. You know, way back when my father had to pay poll tax in 1954 and I got a receipt on my desk that I keep there now. I vow and I have said, I am not going to pay poll taxes, but I'm going to vote. Now, we sort of changed that, and we got a lot of hard work with Dick Marpus, who is one of, to me one of the greatest men I've ever worked with. We fought and we spent a lot of time on destroying barriers to meaningful participation in government by voting. You know, we had motor voter. We worked on a national level with that. No excuses for not registering. We had mail-in registration. That took more of my life than any other project I've ever had. And it was successful. If people couldn't come to the courthouse, you mail in your voter registration card. That was simple. Nobody had an excuse for not voting. When we came into the office, you had to vote. You had to register in the county and in the city. Absurd. We did away with that with a lawsuit. Register one place and that'll take it forever. Okay, I leave and go home and, 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 and start another uh, project. The next thing I know, we've gone back to voter ID. When you get ready to vote, you got to show that you are the person that you say you are. It never became a problem until African Americans started voting. Then it became a problem. So I'm not jumping up and down saying everything is going to be all right. I said that earlier. We were at a conference in North Carolina, in fact, last week, and it was called Post-Shelby Remedies. What are we going to do? And you had minds from all over the, 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 the United States coming together talking about what can we do, what can we do? And we left with we're going to do what we've been doing. 
But the question, is that enough? And directly responding to your question, what are we doing in Mississippi? We're trying to get individuals to understand it is not a choice. You must vote. But before you vote, you have to register. There are so many people who wait until two weeks before the election. Well, man, I'm going to vote against him because I don't like him. Well, okay, but when did you register? Register? I got to register to vote? Yeah, you do. We missed a, pop we missed a group of people who don't know that they have to register first and then vote. That's where we lose a lot of actual contact with, you have to register. We're going to have to start all over and hopefully make a difference. But being optimistic, I'm not jumping up and down as I said earlier. I believe that young people, you can make a difference. We can tell you what's up ahead based upon what's in the past. But you're going to have to get out there and decide what the future holds because of what you can do yourself. And I think you were, were very, very cor most correct in saying that you all can do it. You just have to be convinced that you must do it. And if somebody else is fixing your breakfast for you, you will never learn how to cook biscuits. But if you have to cook those biscuits yourself, you'll become an expert at it, and you can train others to likewise cook, cook biscuits. Questions? Any other questions? Yes, sir, right here. There's Bob. This may not be a question, Judge. <laughs> well, I it, know it, Bob. Bob, it's not. one, 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 <laughs> one minute. So you told a great story the last time we heard you talk about your class picture at law school. And the question is, after that happened, how do I find you 40 years later at the University of Mississippi accepting an award? When I graduated from law school, we took our picture after we were sworn in. Um, my classmates, all white males, um, were bigger guys, they were big. And, I was at the back. I don't know how I got at the back. But they, prob they probably did not want to be seen with me. So consequently, I was covered up. But as our make maker has, has uh, determined, I was able to step on my tiptoes and get on the picture, which messed it up for them. Um, I did not feel as though I was accepted by my classmates. In fact, I, I, I know that I was not accepted. I felt that I was tolerated because I pretty much demanded to be tolerated. So my days at the university, as, as, as Bob knows, were not good days. The uh, assassination of Dr. King destroyed me temporarily. Uh, we were scheduled to go to Memphis that night, and I was trying to finish up my homework before I left. And before I finished, I was told that he had been murdered. The outpouring of joy by my classmates angered me. And our responses were, I got into a fight. I threw some coffee on a guy's white shirt. I cried. I cried myself to sleep. We closed the university. Certain things we just wouldn't take. Those were not good days. Um, when Robert Kennedy was, was murdered, the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, the next year, I, I was I mean, that, that same year, I was, I was devastated. Because when his brother, John, was killed, was assassinated, I was at Tougaloo. And I cried for many days. So Bob's question is, having experienced that and, and then getting an award, 
by, by the law school. I've often asked myself the same question, but I think that the university has been fortunate to have professors who are realistic. The professors that I had at the university, there were four. Uh, they were from Harvard, Yale, Columbia. And they were sent here by Ford Foundation to open a legal services program. And that's where I worked. Those guys rubbed off on others. And you may not see the bread rising after you put the yeast in there immediately, but when you come back, you'll see an increase in the size. I want to believe that the sacrifices that, that were made were not sacrifices. They were part of a bigger picture. And I have always respected, as in the case of Judge Porter, I've respected positions. I may disagree and obviously did with my parents on many occasions, but I respected them. I disagreed with my professors, but I respected them. And when I got out of practice, I don't think there was ever any judge for 10 years that I ever agreed with, but I respected them. So I think that the university has looked at its mission, um, what changes have been made, and, and realize that there are some of us who actually care. And decided to, to add diversity, I guess. Um, I've often asked myself, Bob, that same question. And I, I've yet to come up with an answer that I can be comfortable with. But my parents always told us, if you do the right thing, it may not be popular, but it will last. And doing the right thing has always been a part of my life. I cannot sleep if I do the wrong thing. OK, we've got some questions right here. Let's, hey, we got one, then we'll get to you right here. No, we'll give it to you. Yeah. Hi, thanks for being here. I wanted to ask you your view now with your long arc in the um, civil rights era. Where do you think um, we need to work in terms of preserving democracy as um, we know it or as we want it to be? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I, I think the education of our children is uh, the keystone to maintain the, the, the democratic uh, system that we have in this country. Our children don't even know who they are. Our children cannot read. Our children can't write. So it's very difficult for them to make informed decisions if they can't read, if they can't write. Uh, our children can't even write their names uh, to, to ask a kid. We have a mentoring program in, in Forest we have young people who cannot write their names. Some are in the 10th grade. So if we don't nurture the individuals who are going to be responsible for our democ democratic way of life, then we're giving those who don't want democracy to, to, to thrive and survive, we're giving them the keys to our country. Um, it, it's just so critical that, 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 we, that we do something about this terrible educational system that we have. And I've always believed, and that would probably help me decide about going to the university, I've always believed that if you pay taxes, there's some things that you should expect. And, you know, I don't expect to have to buy a car every year because the roads tear them up. You know, I don't expect to have people who are, have mental challenges to be running around with guns shooting up everybody. 
We have a moral responsibility as taxpayers to expect a return and or a dividend on our investment. And right now, I don't see that happening. The schools are not up to par. The teachers don't get paid. You know, the, the mental health is a serious problem. Physical health is a serious problem. You finally get uh, a, a insurance where everybody can, can go to the doctor and nobody has to die because of that status. And now we want to change that. You know, the state of Mississippi is, is it, it, I'm, I'm a Mississippi, and the state gets an F insofar as mental health and physical health of its citizens. So if we're talking about preserving democracy, first of all, we have to have individuals who can spell democracy. And then we need individuals who can sign and write their names so they can check out books on democracy. You know, we, we are falling short and we can't pass the buck on to these young children. We need to resolve those conflicts. Otherwise, the uh, United States of America is just going to be a thing of the past. And then we need to be careful about our leaders. You know, you see your child acting bad and you say, well, okay, he'll act better. And he continues to act bad. You say, well, he'll, you know, he'll get a little bit better. You know, and he keeps, and he starts throwing spitballs and, you know, turning over chairs and sticking his tongue out at folks and beating up cats, you know, and, and, and fighting dogs and making, the, you know, there comes a time when you, as a parent, need to stand up and say, okay, enough of this is enough. If we don't fight to preserve the democracy that we have, we will lose it. Okay, we got time for one more question. Yes, sir, right here. There are so many uh, topics that are compelling today, and you've answered two, um, but I do want to go back selfishly to the time that Judge Porter was so disrespectful to you, and then you wound up sitting behind that same bench when you were serving as a judge, did you receive the respect that you were due, and why, if you were? And if you weren't uh, respected, what did you do about that when lawyers did not treat you as with the honor and due that black robe requires? I received the respect that I was due. Uh, I, I take this position. If you give respect, you will receive it. And when you don't receive it, all you have to do is look a certain way, and it's forthcoming. It's, um, you know, my daughter used to tell me, she said, Mama, I would rather you spank me than look at me. <laughs> you know, I'm saying to myself, wait, wait. And she didn't tell me that until she was older. And um, sometimes my ex-husband, I say ex, ex-husband would tell me, don't look at me like that. You know, so, so I just have a look. If somebody's being disrespectful, they, I just look a certain way. And uh, is it a, a woman's way? What, what? Mama's, mama's look. look, okay, mama's look or whatever. But I just look a certain way. And um, my reputation had preceded me. People knew that it was best <laughs> to uh, comply. Um, I, I am a no-nonsense person when I'm dealing with other people and I have a position of authority. I believe in being fair. It may work against me, but I believe in doing the right thing. And, and every one of the guys who practiced before me, and there were guys, uh, there were no women, knew me. And, you know, I'm a no-nonsense person. The, the practice of law, uh, the, the system of justice is very serious. And I treat it with utmost respect. And I'm, no foolishness allowed. Well, let me, let's, let's just say this, that, uh, you know, in, in our city where there are civil rights icons known as the Little Rock Nine and Mrs. Daisy Bates, uh, yes. in the state of Mississippi, 
when you talk about the civil rights icons. We're, we're, we have one standing on this stage right here. And I think one of the greatest tributes to you is that every year I go to your alma mater <laughs> and I speak and teach and recruit at your alma mater. And as I have gone over the last eight to 10 years, as I walk from the inn at Ole Miss through that campus, past the Lyceum, past the monuments, uh, what I've noticed every year is an increasing number of students and faculty and staff of color. Mm -hmm. And that they are walking on that path that you walked. And that may be your greatest legacy of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Constance Slaughter. Hampton.